I was thinking this morning, getting ready for our conversation, that we've been friends for 37 years. Eternally friends. Eternally friends. And you're one of the most amazing women that I have ever known. And I and am. And so are you. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm interviewing you. Okay. <laughs> so, and when I thought about it, you know, in, in, in preparing, I was thinking of all the lives you've led. And I, I would like you to, I, I remember the story that you told me about when you decided to be a doctor. And could you take us into that story? Well, I was going to study psychology. And um, then my mother died. I was already studying psychology in college, and she died when I was 21 of uh, blood poisoning. And she was beautiful, young, didn't have her gray hair on her head. She was only 53. And then I decided to change my major to medicine because I had to find out why a beautiful, healthy young woman would drop dead. How old was she? 53. 53, oh. And uh, there was no warning. She just felt numb. She called the doctor. He said, oh, come on over when you finish your babysitting job. She went over and just died in his office. And it was such a shock to me and to everyone. And we couldn't find out for eight weeks why she died because they, you know, they did a brief autopsy. Nothing wrong with her brain, nothing wrong with her heart. And took eight weeks to get a lab report back showing that she had a septicemia, blood, blood poisoning. And uh, that was way back and, you know, way back when. And it was probably ha had, probably had to do with menopause. And they didn't have tampons and those kinds of things. And they would just use old rags. And uh, they think that some of the blood got back into the uterus and caused her to have blood poisoning. But mm -hmm. none of us knew why she died. For eight weeks, no one had any idea why. She just dropped dead. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to go into medicine. But you also, uh, um, you were born a twin. Yeah. And Wendell had polio. Yeah. And now. Can you say something about that? I mean, in being a twin, first of all, what's it like being a twin? Well, uh, he was like, uh, I was the first twin, and the first twin always, the head shaped so that you're ready to be born. But the second one, the head has molded. So mm. the second twin always gets a head battering, and he was very weak. So he was like my first child. I just mm. adopted him from birth on. He was my baby. I took care of him, and my dad always scolded me for always going to bat for your brother again. And then uh, my mother, in her change of life, had another child, her ninth child, my younger sister. So she was my second child. So I had babies from the time I was, you know, always had my kids that I was taking care of. Also, I was uh, another reason I wanted to become a doctor is that I was roller skating um, when I was. 14, and my girlfriend had a seizure. And I stopped everybody, pushed everybody away from her while I was holding her, and I saw something white in her head. And hmm. I, she was my best friend, but her parents had never told me that she had epilepsy and that she had had uh, uh, meningitis when she was a baby and she had scar tissue on her brain. And they thought that was what I was seeing in her brain, was scar tissue. So that also was another reason why I wanted to be a doctor. And when, um, when Wendell got po how old was Wendell when he got polio? He was 14. He was 14. He was in a wheelchair from 14 on until he committed suicide when he was 50, 57. Because he had post-polio syndrome and he couldn't play bridge, he couldn't fish, he couldn't do all the things he liked to do anymore. And he just said, I've had it. So he, uh, he did himself in with carbon monoxide. And so the, you know, in tracing the saga of your life, I remember the kind of awakening you had in relation to your, your sexual being. Well, that's really been very interesting because in the last few years I've been really studying the goddess history. And when patriarchy started about three or 4,000 years ago and how, you know, the, the Jews and the Aaron's came into Canaan, and the new way of wealth in those days was to own property and herd cattle and sheep rather than vegetables and vegetarianism, mm -hmm. which all the, the tribes had practiced before that. And so they came in and they thought, you know, might makes right, and they were 
suppressing and exterminating the people there, the goddess peoples, and Yahweh, their new god that they installed, his main enemy was the great mother goddess, who was, uh, you know, represented by queens who for 8,000 years had run that area, that part of the world. So he did everything he could to push down women, push down women's freedom, push down women's sexuality. It was much easier to suppress women than it was to suppress the sexuality. But women were, when they were exterminating all of the this is what I'm writing my book about now, right? And by the way, God's Fear of Woman is the mm -hmm. name of my book. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's coming along, working. I'm that's, working pretty, that's a pretty uh, daring title, I must say. Well, that's, that's the truth of it. God is scared of women, and for good reason, because women had the creativity, they had the body, they had the sexuality, they had the knowing, and women were totally different in those days. They were... They were lawyers, they were doctors, they were architects. They had plumbing 3,000 years ahead of Greece, underground plumbing and all kinds of things. And um, the women were powerful. And the men were starting to come up. This is evolution, too. Men were starting to come up into power. Women had been in power for 35,000 years of history that we know. Mm -hmm. There had been no male gods before. Women were always seen as the creator, the originator of life. The men were mystified by the periods coming regularly mm -hmm. and their women forming children out of their own bodies. And so women were esteemed and very high and held as holy and magical. Their, their flesh was magical. And they celebrated the, the, the sex was a gift from the goddess. And they would have celebrations of, you know, moon... Uh, celebrations and that sort of thing and when the the Jews and the Arons came in they came from another um, doxology where the thunder gods were mm -hmm. in control and they really uh, just started wiping out the goddess peoples but anyway as I was studying all this I realized that I my father I was raised in a fundamental Christian home mm -hmm seventh of nine children and my father was very devout but we had a small house and a large family so my twin brother and I had to sleep on a day bed with our heads at different ends and our hands always outside of the covers you don't ever you know you, they get you get checked to make sure your hands aren't under the covers You're not supposed to touch yourself but we would sleep there we slept until we were seven years old we had to sleep in the living room next to my parents and then my parents didn't have their own bedroom. They had a, they lived in the parlor and there were no doors in it. So every night we would hear my father kneel by the bedside praying to Jesus or to great father God. And I was always trying to see what was under his long underwear. I was very curious about that much more than what he was saying in the prayers. And then he would go to bed and my parents would make love frequently, very discreetly. But then my mother would get up and spend a half hour in the bathroom cleaning up almost every night. So here I was, juxtaposed with a devout religion and then making love. And my parents loved each other very much. My mother worshipped my father. She loved him dearly. He was eight years older than she was. No, 24, 17. She was 17 when he married, and he was 24, seven years older. But she loved him, and he loved her too, although he didn't realize how much he loved her until she dropped dead, and his mm -hmm. life was... I mean, he was a zombie for five years. He could not believe it. He mm -hmm. had sort of taken her for granted mm -hmm. because she was adoring him. But I had this very strong connection between spirituality, devout devotion to God, and making love. Mm -hmm. Then, as I got older and boys started coming around, my father started preaching to me about how bad sex was and how I shouldn't flirt with the boys and that sort of thing. It didn't make any sense to me. And so it was sort of like at some point I had to choose between God and sex. And I chose sex because I <laughs> liked having all the boys attracted to me and I felt popular. And, um, you know, and my father was so worried that I was going to marry one. Of, we, I was raised in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and all the Indians, the, the Indians had been moved off of the reservations into the small towns and they had no work. It was the Depression then. And most of them were very susceptible to alcohol. Yeah. And my father was certain I was going to marry a drunken engine. 
So when I was 13, he said, we're moving out of here. And we moved to California. He was very much afraid that I would marry an Indian boy because I had a couple of Indian boyfriends that I really liked. And my father had all these prejudices. He thought Jews were the chosen people and they could do no wrong. Indians were drunken bums. He didn't say much about the blacks. We were right across the track from nigger town. And we didn't talk about them because we never saw any. None were in the schools or anything. But there were just these dark people and we'd, we'd have nigger shooters. And we'd shoot, fight with the kids across the tracks. You know, shoot rocks at them and they would shoot rocks at us. And mm. that's all we knew about the black people. Mm. But I don't think my father actually really knew any adult. Jews or Indians or blacks, but he had all these pre prejudices. He thought Catholicism was the church of the devil and the Pope was the devil in disguise. Actually, I think he's right, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if I recall, you ran off with... Um, uh, at, when you were very young, you, you ran off. Two weeks after I was 18, I went off and married a, a nice Catholic boy. <laughs> Yeah, wasn't he? It wasn't he was he a Portuguese. Portuguese, yeah. Portuguese Catholic yeah. boy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did because even though I didn't believe in God and I refused to go be baptized when I, was thir when I was 12, like my docile twin brother did go, but I refused and my father gave up on me. He thought, sure, Satan was talking to me all the time and he just sort of gave up on me then. But uh, after that, I didn't have much to do with religion. I said, I, first I said I was an atheist, and I found out that I was an agnostic. And I refused to believe, but I still was afraid if I had sex before I got married, that the God I didn't believe in would strike me dead. Yeah. So I got married to the captain of the football team, who was repu reputu reputed to have a big cock. And I wanted to find out what that was all about and why everyone admired him so much. And I did find out. <laughs> I married him. It took me three months to get it in because it was so big. <laughs> uh, anyway, he's a wonderful man. And I was married to him for nine months until I realized that I had just married him for sex. Mm. And he, every day he said, you've got to quit going to college. That college is causing you trouble. Sounded like my father about religion. And I thought, I have to leave. So nine months after I got married, uh, I left the marriage. I left him standing in the, he was a farmer, I left him standing in the orchard crying on a hoe and I never saw him, talked to him or spoke to him again and his parents sent me a letter and he was able to get our marriage annulled even though we'd been married nine months and he, his mother's name was Mary and his father's name was Joseph and he married a nice girl and they had four children and I wished him all the luck in the world. But uh, so that's how I, to answer your question about the juxtaposition of sex and religion, I always had them very equated, but very antagonistic too. Mm. So I pushed it all underground, mm -hmm. all the stuff about religion, and just said I don't want anything to do with it. I started having children when I was 19. I had five children, of biological children, plus five abortions. I finally found out what was causing it, so I could stop having doing that. But uh, uh, I didn't really realize how much that in influenced me until I started writing this book. And then things started coming back to me. Like what? About the, the, the oppression that my father had about women and about sexuality. Even though my father, I believe, loved me, my mother paid more attention to the kids in the family who were dependent. And I was more independent, so she didn't pay much attention to me, but my father did. He liked my sass, and I, he, he was a mechanic. And I would go by his garage on the way home from school, and I would show him my report card, and he would give me a dime for every A and go around and show all the men in the shop my good grades. So that got me inspired to meet, be a really good student. So I was always a really good student. And he was always proud of that, even though he was very worried about my soul. He thought I was very smart. But you know, you... I mean, just to put this on record, you've told me stories of when you were in medical school and you, uh, you brought the kids with you uh, to the class? Well, no, I, I worked story? in a clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked, well, my husband worked too, but we had three kids and I worked in the clinic and I was all, all night there and I would take the kids to the clinic with me and the dog too. And I would be, I, I remember once I was sewing up a guy, I had to do 23 stitches on him, he was in a motorcycle accident. And I'm sewing it up and I'm looking up and here's my three little kids all looking around <laughs> in the window watching me and the dog too. And they held, <laughs> held the dog to keep him from coming in and they were all watching me. 
But I took them everywhere with me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't get much child care. I slept them to day, you know to to the daycare center on the way to medical school, and then pick them up when I would come home. And the dean of, of the medical school was so interested that I had this extra burden of three little children, two, three, and four, when I started medical school. That he chose one student each year to kind of guide and be there, be his, um, be their advisor. So he followed me all through four years of medical school and was very helpful. But we did fine. And those kids, my mother and my parents were so worried, you know, that I was going to leave those poor kids orphans and go to medical school. But those three kids turned out wonderfully. They're all wonderful, loving, great friends. I had them when I was, well, when I was 19, 20, but, and 22. You know, I, I mean, that's been the thing with you. You know, my, my memory of you, you know, because we've been such good friends for so long, is when we used to go to Las Vegas, yeah, <laughs> and you would be the high roller, yeah, and I and and that's kind of like the, when I was thinking about this interview, and I was thinking about that uh, that you've always been on that edge. You know, I've always known you to be like that of t of daring, mm -hmm. and of having a a certain chutzpah, and of you know, beating the odds and of, uh, of this sort of charging through. And, and, and I think of all the lives you've led and, and how, I mean, how many people could have three kids and go to medical school? It was unusual. I was, <laughs> unusual, was I would. Seven women and 210 men in class. But I did well and I have a, I, I have a, what they call an eidetic memory. Mm -hmm. Like I can, uh, if I'm taking a test, I can see page 75 of the biochemistry book that talks about that. That's wow. it's a gift, and my twin brother had that also. He became an accountant. Wow. And we had that, so, and I could get by on very little sleep, so I did, uh, I did okay with that. But so the, the phase um, of what, uh, if, you, if, if you don't mind, when you started getting into being a psychiatrist, so how did that segue from medical school and sewing up somebody in a motorcycle accident to how did that? Okay, I was going to be an obstetrician and gynecologist. Oh. And when I did my internship at uh, LA County Hospital, mm -hmm. during my internship, the chief resident liked me, so he let me deliver twins and do a lot of things that other interns didn't get to do. And I heard so many women screaming I hate that man, I'll never do this again, but they'd be in the next year to have their next kid. But anyway, it was so bloody that after that month of rotation, of, and I delivered over 100 babies in, uh, in that month, I decided I wanted to do something that wasn't so bloody. So I decided I wanted to go into psychiatry. Well, that, I mean, that is just so amazing. You know, the, the, the and so, and in the, uh, how long, well, you still are, you still have patients. Oh, yeah, I still have. I'm trying to retire, but people don't let you retire. No, you're not going to retire. I, I, I'll I, never retire, no. but I wanted to just write. But, you know, I, I probably get 500 emails a day from all over the world. And, you know, ma mainly it's from autism because uh, I, I, I have a granddaughter. My 12th of my 13 grandchildren has autism. And she is my heartbeat. I love her more than anything. And she started coming to Hawaii when she was four to spend a month every summer with us. And I began majoring in autism. So then I wrote a book called Children with Starving Brains. Mm -hmm. And that book has sold 60,000 copies in this country and all over the world. It's been translated all over. Mm -hmm. And that made me very famous because I got in on the biological biomedical treatment of autism a lot sooner than a lot of other doctors. Yeah, so do. I beat the crowd. Now there's hundreds of books on autism, but mm -hmm. I was there before other people did that. But I learned a lot about medicine. Autism is an extremely complex disease. When you work with autistic kids, you have to know endocrinology, you have to know mm -hmm. neurology, you have to know psychiatry, you have to know gastroenterology. They all have gastroenterology. Uh, syndromes. So I have really become the physician that I always wanted to be mm. from working with autistic children for 11 or 12 years. You know, it's interesting how uh, how suddenly our life takes a turn that it wouldn't have taken. 
But the issue around, um, I mean, when I, when I, you know, speak with you, because I never had children, and I, c I knew that I never could do that. I can't do what you do. I just well, I couldn't do what you do, well, that, darling. <laughs> well, that may be true. That's why we're friends. But I was thinking also about the, I mean, just the enormous um, scope of what you have have encompassed in your life. I mean, it's really quite staggering. Well, when you think I'll be 80 in three months, oh my God. I've had a long time to do a lot of things. Some people don't live that long, and I'm still very vital and very healthy. But I want to talk to you about the real gist of the book that I'm writing now is really about mature women. I think the mature women, it's a huge waste of woman power that women give up and after menopause think they're over the hill. Of course, we have a huge problem of ageism and sexism and everything else. But I am here to tell you, and I'm telling people in my book, that menopause is the release of an enormous kind of sexuality and a kind of sensuality that you don't have when hormones are driving you. Mm. I mean, where sexuality used to be oriented into my genitals primarily, now it's all over my body. And mm. I feel it in a different way, and it is a path to the spirit I mean, here I've meditated for years, read, read a thousand books on spiritual development, taken workshops in India and everywhere else, and what really is so powerful is the sexual love route to spiritual development. And I'm really, I'm really wanting and calling women to come into that and to not give up when they're over 50 or they're over 60 or they're over 70, because that is the richest time here I've had this very rich and full life and have been very sexual from the time I was 18. I led the sexual revolution in the 60s. I was the head of the Brawless Brigade over there and I've always been very active sexually. But what's happened since menopause has been absolutely amazing to me. And I don't think a lot of women know it. As you're speaking, and I'm thinking of the attitude around religions in, in regard to sexuality. Right. You're right on. So... That's exactly what it is. Organized religion has from the beginning, because of Yahweh's fear and hatred and jealousy of the Great Mother Goddess, and the fear that men might be attracted to women more than they would be attracted to kissing his ass day and night, five times a day, and all that stuff. I mean, talk about egotistical, that anyone could read the Bible and think that that wasn't written by human men who want to have domination over, over women. They're just, they're just not using their brain. They're just taking the, the imprint of what they were taught when they were kids, you know, that men are superior, that women are to serve men and that being sexual is not nice and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, there has been a whole vendetta with organized religion, the three organized Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that are totally into suppressing the power of women. And women are glorious. They're creative. They're sensual. They're intuitive. They have a lot of qualities. If men only knew what they are missing, by not really being open to that. They're so afraid they'll be overpowered or someone will think they're a wuss or something like that. But men have no idea of the glory they would come into to really love a woman totally. What they would get sexually, spiritually, sensually, emotionally, every other way. That's what my book is about. It's not only to wake up women, but men to have to really accept a whole new level of understanding of the feminine. Well, can I, um, can I ask you something about, this is my impression, and why the, the fact that men come out of the woman's body, and for the first phase of life, they're completely dependent upon the woman. And so the woman is, there's a trigger in relation to right being on. close to a woman, right. is that dependency trigger. And so it's a love-hate relationship, really. I know very few men who can get past that. I think your husband, Jack, is one of them. I mean, he yes. is the model of a man who has managed to 
shift the scene in in and how do you I mean how do you think that happened well for one thing Jack had the privilege of being raised by parents who loved him very very much he was the first son in a in a well-to-do Jewish family in New York and his mother spent most of her time she recorded every bite of food he took she mm. loved him and his father loved him too so he had that blessing and yet he was shy Hmm. He wasn't developed very much sexually, and he married a woman who wasn't very interested in sexuality mm -hmm. and at that time. Mm -hmm. And when he met me, mm -hmm. he was developed, and he's brilliant. He's a Ph.D. mathematician. He's brilliant, wonderful, but he was shy sexually. Here I miss, you know, <laughs> miss <laughs> sexuality. And so it was an incredible right. mix. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as he came, became aware sexually, he advanced and enlarged enormously as a human being. Mm -hmm. And as his love and his wisdom helped me come out of just being a strutter. I mean, I was, you know, the head her, tw baton twirler in high school, and I taught all the other girls how to twirl the baton, and I was always leading the band and always, you know, showing my legs. I had pretty legs, and I still do, but uh, that was my claim to fame, my beautiful legs. So I'm always in Sadie Hawkins costumes or uh, yell uh, leading costumes or drum majorette costumes and everything. So I was into being a sort of a strutter. And he kind of toned me down with that because I really admired a man for the first time in my, mm. in my life in a way that I hadn't before. I loved all my, I, uh, he's my fourth husband. And I loved all my husbands in the way I loved them sexually. Mm -hmm. I loved, I still love the father of my first three children. He's a wonderful man, but we just outgrew each other. He has a wonderful wife now. She's much better for him. Mm. He had a hard time keeping up with me. And the other man was, uh, well, you know, you know, he was, uh, had trouble with drinking and he had real trouble with my power. Yeah. So those three were pretty disastrous and Jack was finally able to deal with my power and he helped me tone it down so that I could be, you know, I don't know what you call it, a more agreeable, a more amenable human being, <laughs> rather than having to run everything that I touch, you know. But I still, I still like to run most things if, I'm, if I can, just because uh, I have that ability to organize and to get people going on projects and that sort of thing. I can inspire them. So I, I want to do that. Now, the thrust of the book that you're writing is, um, the issue of the patriarchy. Now, did the goddess cultures fight back in any way? Did they resist? No, they I mean, were not prepared for war. They uh -huh. did not have a weapon. Hmm. Well, it, they did not have any weapons. All of the archaeology has now discovered a lot of things that they didn't even know 50 years ago. There were no weapons of war, no evidence that there had ever been any war in the goddess cultures. They were, they, men and women were equal. Men were uh, revered as uh, hunters and, uh, you know, uh, food procurers. But the women, it was a metrilineal society. The women owned the houses, and children were sort of everybody's children. It was much different. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the people who came in, they wanted organization. They wanted to be a men's club, and they really did. I mean, if you, all you need to do anybody needs to do is read the first chapters of the Holy Bible, the Old Testament, and you will hear slaughter after slaughter after mm -hmm. slaughter under Yahweh's directions for them to slaughter everyone in the village except the young virgins they could keep for slaves, concubines, and wives. So all of the, all of the first uh, Jewish women in Canaan were from the goddess peoples that they had, they had they'd slaughtered their brothers and their whole families and they would just save the girls and they'd let the girls mourn for a month or two and then they would start putting them on the, you know, selling them as slaves if they, or if they were beautiful, they would keep them for their wives or whatever. But uh, so it's about really, my book is what organized religion has really done to women mm -hmm. to try to suppress and keep down women's power and what they're doing is keeping down their beauty and their sensuality and their love of sexuality. When I hear a woman be, you know, prudish and smug about 
not ever having sex and that sort of thing. I just, I grieve at, the, at what she has missed in her life hmm. because that kind of surrender that you can have in a deep sexual relationship where two people really surrender to each other, I mean, what we create is what we call a third, like a third energy that's not mine or not Jack's, mm -hmm. but it's like what we call our third, and that is a higher order for us. And that guides us in our work and in our, in our spiritual work and our trip to Africa where we did research. We've done a lot of things that we couldn't have done if we hadn't had our marvelous relationship. So I really feel the book is about what men have lost in trying to honor their fear of women, their denial of the power of women, and what women have lost by submitting to it because most women have been under patriarchy for so long they think that's the way it should be. Well I'm curious as a psychiatrist because there are women that come, they're Middle Eastern women and I think I'm um, uh, I'm very sensitive to women that come from the uh, from China, from Japan, uh, um, uh, not so much Korea I, I, even though it is Asian. Well, but Indonesia, it, they have a lot of and, and the Middle East. Yeah. But the Middle Eastern women in particular, they come to class and they, they get really scared and they leave. Yeah. And, and, and I can see the burqa uh, on the energetic burqa that they have. And I wondered what you, and, and what I'm understanding also is that they, the burqa is back in a lot of the Middle Eastern cultures. Yes, because as the, uh, as the Arab Spring has come, the Islamics are just waiting to take over from where the dictator left off, <clears throat> and they want to impose their own form of dictatorship. Yeah. I hope they're going to fight it in Libya. The women are already getting very upset because the very first thing the next guy in order says is Sharia, Sharia. law. Mm -hmm. Sharia law is going to be practiced here. Now he's backtracking. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to be moderate. We're not going to be mm -hmm. extreme. Mm -hmm. But uh, he felt that most of the people that had given up their life had been the Islamic group. They're the ones that were most powerful mm -hmm. to get uh, Gaddafi out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I think that they have been so suppressed. But the women who come here and who break away from it they're writing their books, you know, and I've read quite a few of them about the suppression. The, the women are taught that they are totally to obey men from the time they're mm -hmm. born. They're never to refuse a man sexually. Mm -hmm. They're never to argue with them. They have to keep everything af absolutely spick and span and all that. They're enslaved, basically. Yeah. They're enslaved. They even paint their windows black. God forbid, goddess forbid that a man should look in and see anything and they have a got vice squad in some cities where they go around if a woman happens to show an ankle they leap out and beat her and that sort of thing the prejudice against sexuality in women is just atrocious and yet the men are they can have four wives most mm -hmm. islamic groups allow men to have four wives mm -hmm. and all the temporary wives they want women they have an honor thing. If a woman even looks at another man, I mean, she can be easily killed if somebody doesn't like it. I mean, the laws against women are just atrocious, really atrocious. So I, I really want, I would love for my book to be translated into any of those languages, but only 7% of the women are literate, you know, like in Mali, the country we did our research in. Very few women can read or write, so it's very hard to make changes in cultures like that. They're so backwards. You know, you you're you're such a gift to the uh, such a, and a model of the woman being almost eighty years old, and still just sexy. Well, everything. I know. I think it's such a waste. It's such a waste for for men and women. It's really a loss. Well, I'm curious in terms of how do you feel about younger women, women think, of today? I think they need to wake up. For one thing, they're they're forgetting. <laughs> what all us older women had to go through to get, even to get the vote, much less get any kind of rights. And still the Equal Rights Amendment is struggling and people are still, you know, saying that woman does not have a right to her own body and that she shouldn't have an abortion. I mean, that's absolute patriarchy at its worst. Okay, so what are you, as a psychiatrist, yeah. and a, would you call yourself a feminist? Oh, definitely. Okay, I'm good. a humanist, evolutionary feminist. Very good. 
So this whole business in elections, which I always find amusing and, 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 and horrific, is the whole issue of abortion. So, I mean, as a physician, I mean, what? Men are terrified of women's sexuality. And the idea that a woman could be free enough to have sex in some kind of situation where she couldn't or wouldn't want to have the child, this, this whole idea that they're so sympathetic for this poor little fetus, there are millions, Emily, of children starving to death. And are they doing anything about them? No. They're out there, those old farts, actually protesting that a woman should not have the right to have an abortion, that any woman, once she's pregnant, even if she's, and the Catholics, even if her life is endangered, if she's 14, and if it was an incest from her own father, has got to have that baby. And I do think the Pope is the devil in disguise. He knew the Popes were doing the, the pedophilia, and the, just the trans priest. Le, le, a priest, I mean the priest, and, yeah. letting, and letting them be shipped off to other places over and over and over, I think that's evil. And my father was right <laughs> when he said that. My father said, Catholicism is the church of the devil and the Pope is the devil in disguise. When I read all that stuff, you know, 6,000 priests have been indicted so far for wow, pedophilia. Do really? you think if 6,000 have been indicted, how many of them are really guilty? And one was up for sainthood who had children and who sodomized his own children. He was up for Pre, he was up for, what do you call it, the highest order? Bishop or something? No. Cardinal? Cardinal? For sainthood. Oh, sainthood. Uh -huh. But anyway, he's dead now. I mean, they, you know, but after the fact, they found out he had fathered children. He had sodomized his own children. And he had a ritual that he would give to the kids telling them about their funeral if they would dare tell anyone what kind of funeral they would have. I mean, he was a horrible, sadistic bastard in addition to being a sodomist and a, I mean, and that, you know, they've uncovered two monasteries in the last few years in England. They took out, the, they emptied the lakes behind them so they could build, and they found 4,000 in one and 6,000 other baby skulls, newborn skulls. This is what the priests were doing with their brides of uh, Christ, you know, all those years in the monasteries. I mean, it, it, it's really, it's really, when you think of what religion has put on people, I, I just think that it's the worst you know, crime I'm, in the world. I'm thinking of as you're speaking. I'm thinking of how how is she going to manage because you're dealing with the Jewish with Yahweh, and then you're dealing with the Middle Eastern people. Then you're dealing with I mean Islam. Well, I'll have to wear a, a you know a, a bulletproof vest after and, my book. And then published. Catholicism. I mean, and and everything else. And I'm just thinking of the, I'm thinking of you again as the high roller. Yeah. I mean, you used to roll that dice, and <laughs> I mean, I would watch you, and you would, you know, ride that edge, and that, you know, and that. And you, re you remember the tables we picked too with the Texas guys who had a lot of testosterone. Yeah, yeah. So you get there, and you get the dice going. And right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, I learned a lot from all that, but I mean, you're still up to your old tricks, but. But I mean, you are aware that you are, and I love you for that. For this, you know, is that is that how inflammatory? I mean, you're pulling the rug out. Like when I you am. listen to Michelle Bachman and you know all these people, you know, you you know, you're just pulling that. And see, the thing that's great also is that you have credentials. Yeah. You know, you're not some nutcase. I mean, you're a medical doctor. You've 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 contributed enormously to. Uh, in, oh yeah, our two papers are being published. Okay, let's hear it. In the Journal of AIDS Research, AIDS and HIV Research, the two papers that we worked on, Jack and I, for three years in Mali, for uh, the LDN, for the medicine for AIDS. We want it for the children, because the children in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are 15 million orphans in Sub-Saharan Africa from AIDS, from their parents dying, and half of those, or seven and a half million of them, are HIV positive, and you know how many percent get any medical treatment? Seven percent. Not only because of the cost of the drugs, but because they have no medical personnel to manage these kids with the toxic drugs. Here we have a drug, cheap, non-toxic, only have to take one a day. It can be a cream that can be rubbed on their bodies or a pill if they're old enough to swallow a pill. And you know what? We're going to have to get it in under autism because there is so much prejudice about AIDS that if we try to get it through for AIDS, the government won't pass it. But if we get it through 
with autism, we can use it. Now that our two papers are published, one is about LDN alone and the other is used in LDN along with the heart medications, the medications they already use for AIDS. It's much better, it works much better and people never get that um, uh, distortion, you know, fat deposits mm. and all those weird things that they get. If they take LDN along with a regular AIDS medication, none of that lipo dystrophy happens. Okay, so tell us a little bit, I mean, as far as I know about LDN, because most people are not knowing that you're talking about low-dose naltrexone. Yeah, yeah. Well, so why don't you say okay. a little bit about that? Okay. Um, there was a psychiatrist named Dr. Bahari who was working with AIDS patients in 1985, and he was giving them naltrexone, which was a drug to help cut the addiction because most of them, many of them had gotten AIDS from using contaminated needles. And he started using the naltrexone and he noticed that the immune systems got worse on the people who were using naltrexone than the ones who didn't. And he asked uh, Dr. Ian Zagon, who was doing research on naltrexone, and Dr. Nel, uh, Dr. Uh, Zagon is a PhD, but he had done a lot of animal work and he mm -hmm. said, the lower dose you get, the better it works. So Dr. Bahari started lowering the dose and many of those patients who should have been dead long ago are still alive today from using low dose naltrexone. Low dose naltrexone, if you take just a little bit of naltrexone, it fools the pituitary into thinking it's not going to get its usual dosage of endorphins. And so the body puts out all these endorphins and increases the immune system by just making your immune system better. It's not poisoning anything like antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kill anything. All it does, and Jack and I have been on it for seven and a half years now. You've been on it for how long? Uh, well, because anybody who knows you has to go on low right. dose naltrexone. They have to go on low dose naltrexone. <laughs> so, but, it, but also, I mean, it's been really for MS. Oh, yeah. And 85% of people with multiple sclerosis, their multiple sclerosis never goes on. It won't reverse the scar tissue that's already there, but 85% of them, and there's a there's a, an email list called lodosnaltrexone.org that will give people all the information that they, they want about lodosnaltrexone, and there's an e-list that has 10,000 members on it, and many of them are multiple sclerosis, but also mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis, Sogren's, um, uh, all kinds of um, immune, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, uh, all kinds. But here's the thing also, is that you and Jack paid for this research in Mali. Yes, we did because we could, you, you, the only people who can afford original research are the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. No pharmaceutical company is gonna spend one dime on anything that's a generic drug. It was already a generic drug when we discovered it and it's cheap. For 19 bucks a month, you can get this drug, and the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't give us any money to do it. And we applied to Gates, and we applied to a lot of other people, but here we are. We're not connected with any university. We're independent people. So we just decided it was worth doing it ourselves. So we took it out of our retirement account, and we paid for it. Well, we did get, I mean, you helped. A lot yeah. of people helped. Yeah. I mean, we got $100,000 from all our friends, and then mm -hmm. we had to pay 250000 ourselves to get the research done because it took 14 doctors and all kinds of researchers and PhD pharma pharmacologists and all those people over in Mali and we had to go over there and get them interested in doing the thing and I had to fight with the Islamic people so I had to step back and let Jack act like he was running it even though it was my idea but he, he is a, a PhD mathematician with the statistical help and he ended up being tremendous help in writing papers so we just got two papers and they're going to be published this month either uh, late October or early November in the Journal of HIV AIDS Research, very prestigious journal. So we're very proud of ourselves and that's going to put LDN on the map. Well here's the thing also, you know you've always put your money where your mouth is and so I'm... So when I don't have any talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you were telling me about the book, now you've been writing it for what three years? Or three years. And, and the immensity of what you're putting out. So how do you see, in other words, it, in a way it's a kind of a legacy? Yes, but also I really want to inform people. I want to be a model if people can see me. Right. I'm 80, I love sex, have it at least two or three times a week, 
am madly in love with my husband. We've been married 35 years, and we love each other more than we ever have. We've done a lot of good in the world. So I can be a model for people who say, hey, it's not all over after menopause. And also, I manage probably 150 women's hormones. I can always give people, women, hormones to adjust if they want, the bioidentical hormones, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. and you can always use a little testosterone if you want to get something going a little better. If you haven't been doing it for a long time and you forgot what it feels to have a great <laughs> orgasm, you can take some testosterone cream and, you know, get that going. But once you get it going yourself, you don't even need that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of women do need it because they think it's all over and after menopause they stop having sex and they think they're over the hill and there's a lot of ageism, so men will always a lot of times we'll pick younger women. And then you see all these young women with these old husbands yeah. because there's all this age span. But uh, that's not necessary. Men are missing out, really. But it's because women have been suppressed. Again, my vendetta is, is against organized religion. And my vendetta is against people who don't really appreciate the incredible gift they have within their own body and all their cells. And you and I have... You know, what's interesting is that we come <laughs> to the same place by such different methods. It's always been fascinating to me that you have this intuition at a cellular level. I could have never gotten it the way you get it, mm -hmm. through movement and through the way you meditate with your body, but I've gotten it through sexuality. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. me, that's been my route mm -hmm. to uh, ever since I've been really young into greater uh, consciousness and greater awareness, greater activity, greater enthusiasm. You're living your dharma. Yeah. Now, do you you wrote a book with Jack called Flesh and Spirit? So, I do. Yes. Fifteen years ago, we wrote a book. It was way ahead of time, called Flesh and Spirit: The Mystery of Intimate Relationship. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were already intuiting a lot of things that we've fleshed out now. And that book needs to be revised. But we were already on to it. We were on to what we're on now, mm. but we were out in the world doing all kinds of things, and that was just one of the sidelines of things we're doing, we were doing at that time. But Flesh and Spirit does talk about, we actually talk about the third, creating a third that is between two people that really helps guide them. And you sit down and meditate, and you tune into your third, and what does a relationship need? Well, not what do I need, what do I want, what do you need, but what does a relationship need? And we've always had a higher calling that our relationship is to serve the world as well as ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we got that, but we just did. We were sort of head, heading that way even when we met. And once we got into the work, we started working at the C Center for the Healing Arts. Mm -hmm. That's where we met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people were dying of cancer, and we would teach them how to meditate and how to image healing energies. And people were living much longer, and everybody saying, "Why? saying, what, what's going on here? But even then, we were way ahead of our time. But now, that book does need to be revised because they know now that a lot of the things that we were doing enhanced the immune system, mm -hmm. even optimism. And certainly sexuality enhances the immune system. I haven't been sick in years. Mm -hmm. and Jack did have a kidney stone, but I don't know if you could call that no. at 80. He's not already the same 80. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really being sick. No. <laughs> That's just he doesn't drink enough water because he's yeah. too busy. But yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we really do feel that... Uh, uh, our deep sexual relationship, LDN has certainly helped, and the, the work that we do that inspires us have kept us going. You know what I think is ironic, I mean, with all your railing, <laughs> is that our Lord, the Savior, and yet you have been the Savior. <laughs> I mean, when I think of the various projects, like the LDN, the low-dose naltrexone, now, you found that through the work with autism. Is that how that uh, yes. came about? Yes. I had a huge autism practice, and all children with autism are immunocompromised. That's one mm -hmm. of their big problems. They don't exactly know why, but kids with autism have poor immune systems. So they all have gastrointestinal infections. They have constant infections. They have growth delay. They, of course, don't talk and all that. So I, um, I was working with... Um, uh, autistic children, and mm -hmm. I was doing studies on them. And the lab director, Dr. Vojdani of Immunosciences, called me and he said, Dr. McCandless, he said, the picture I'm getting of your autism kids 
is very much like multiple sclerosis patients. I'm doing a study with another doctor who's doing multiple sclerosis, and the patterns are very similar. And I say, how interesting. The very same day I read on um, uh, the best therapies that people were getting more um, good luck using low-dose naltrexone with uh, multiple sclerosis than mm -hmm. all of the very expensive drugs they were using. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that is very interesting. So then I looked up low-dose naltrexone, and I decided to do a study. So I did a study with my autism children, and all 80% of them, the CD4 cell, that's a white cell in the body, immune cell, all of them went up, and they weren't low to begin with, and cling, the bell went off in my head. That's the pivotal cell in AIDS and HIV. This has to go to Africa. So that's how that all got started. Actually, it was my lab director, Dr. Vojdani, who clued me in that the pattern of the immune panels for my autistic children were very similar to the immune panels of multiple sclerosis patients, who 85% of them, their multiple sclerosis never progresses anymore once they get on LDN. And on the, the list that has 10,000 people on it, one of the main things we hear is, oh, I wish I'd found this sooner, mm -hmm. because it won't reverse the damage that's already been done, mm -hmm. because it turns into scar tissue in the brain. But it do they don't have any more sessions. And a lot of people are out of their wheelchairs and walking and doing things that they weren't able to do, even though it will reverse it somewhat, but not much. But that's how I, I connected multiple sclerosis with autism and found out that LDN helped both of them. So that's how I got into the research in LDN that we did in Africa. And those are the two studies that are being published this month, the end of this month, in the Journal of AIDS and HIV Research. Well, you know, as your good friend and also you're my doctor, what I'm struck with is the, is the issue of service that you have been in always. And the various, I mean, when I think about it, of saving women, of saving children, and the, the, the things that you've told me in, in relation to how LDN could be used in Africa. Now, you how many of these kids um, have you said are infected? In Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. by the way, 65% of the people who have full-blown AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa are women, where mm -hmm. they get it from their promiscuous, polygamous husbands, and then the husbands will kick them out on the street once they get it because there's such a shame. It's terrible what goes on. wasn't wasn't unusual. We would see a woman sitting in a, a on a street corner with a begging bowl, nursing a baby, and having two or three little toddlers around her. And you know, she's one of these women that the husband kicked out. He she probably has, you know, HIV, and uh, she's kicked out with her children sometimes. Although the men own the children, and if the men want to keep the children, the women are kicked out without their children. They can't own land. They can't. They don't have authority. Over it. The, I just was railing against what I was working with women there, and some of them were saying they were never going to get married because the women were so mistreated mm -hmm. in marriage that once you're married, you're a slave. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the professional women that I work with were deciding that they weren't going to get married because they were lucky enough and had wealthy enough families could, that could give them an education. But they're. The statistics show there are 15 million orphans in sub-Saharan Africa, half of which are HIV positive. And that means 7.5 million, and only 7% of those kids get any kind of medical treatment at all. LDN could go in and save millions of lives. Now people, one guy that I, who had a lot of money, I asked him to help me, he said, why are you going to save all their lives? They're just going to starve to death anyway. Can you imagine that? I mean, he's no longer my friend. but. Um, you know, people people think, why save all those lives if they're going to, you know, they're not going to give them proper nutrition and they can't eat anyway. I mean, I just don't, I don't believe that that's necessary. And uh, if I just could give a big enough clout with my book, maybe I could wake someone like Bill Gates up who's, you know, who would be able, or Clinton. Right. I actually even had a lead to Clinton, but I couldn't, couldn't get a hold couldn't of him to that. help us with our I with was going to, I wanted to ask you, what is the reluctance on the part of the drug companies? Is it because LDN is so inexpensive that they can't make a profit? Exactly. Is that what it is? All of it is profits. Uh -huh. They can't make money off of LDN. They can't make money off of any generic drug. 
The only thing they could do would be invent it and add another molecule to it to make it a different molecule. But this is a basic, simple chemical that's very easy to make and very cheap to make. I mean, we could make it for $15 a year for these children. Oh, gosh. We could manufacture it there, which is what we're shooting for. That's our next, that's our next big gig, <clears throat> is to get it manufactured in Mali for all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm and mainly for the children, although already there are groups that we were using in our studies that are dying to get their hands on it because mm. they were feeling so good on it, they don't want to have to go on the, the harsh, toxic drugs. They want to take LDN. There's no mm. side effects, no toxicity, no addiction. It's cheap. They take it one time a day at night when they go to bed, like you and I do. Mm -hmm. And the children, they have a cream that they just rub on their body. They don't need professional health personnel to manage that. Anyone in the orphanage can treat all of those kids who have HIV. They don't ever need to see a doctor except once a year to get a, an AIDS test. That's all. I mean, it would save so much money, help save so many lives. And um, it's good for everybody. I, I, I was asked to give a talk at an anti-aging conference in Las Vegas. and. Some doctors came, but mostly who came to me were the pharmacologists because they say, this, everyone says this is the best anti-aging medicine around and we want to know what they're talking about. So um, it's getting out there slowly, but uh, not through the doctors. The doctors don't know anything about it. Well, you know, as we're sitting here and I have the honor of being your friend, for one thing, and, and my also- My dearest friend, I love you with all my heart. <laughs> And, and oh, I, I have to say what you said too. Okay, right on. I like I like sex so much, and you said, "Well, you're a twin. You have a twin brother. You were sleeping with men from conception on. You just got <laughs> got hooked true. on it, and never got over it." That's true. <laughs> <laughs> My start to fame, but you ask about service. I think being seventh of nine children in a very poor family. Mm -hmm. And having my younger sister, because my mother was sick of kids by the time she came along, and I really raised her. And she's one of my dearest friends. She's 10 years younger than I. She lives in Ventura. And um, I have a sister 10 years older, too. Uh, and my twin brother, whom I took care of, mm -hmm. always, always took care of him. I think that that got me into service very, yeah, very young. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so impacted by the wealth of what you ha have given to the world. And I am so, no book can ever replace your dynamic presence. And I am so thrilled that we were able to do this oh. and to have you speak from your heart and no matter what you write and how forcefully and how beautifully, et cetera, your presence is the embodiment of flesh and spirit. So. Well, thank you very much. I love you. Mm, I love you too. Oh. Mm. Oh. It's true. It is. It is all true. It is true.